Um, would you stand with us this morning as we're going to uh, kick things off with our first song, This is Amazing Grace.
just because it's one of the, another song I was thinking about that's kind of just been on my heart. It's become one of my favorites over the years um, because I had a good week, not a great week, but a good week. And certain times during the week where you're just kind of feeling down, it's hard to get into what you're doing, hard to feel motivated with what you just need to do in life at times. And you can f- kind of feel like you're not qualified to do certain things like just ill-prepared or just unworthy at certain times so uh the song that i wanted to that i'm going to sing not that i want that i'm going to sing now is uh called confidence by sanctus real um another song that i've played here once or twice it's because that's just something that's been on my heart where it's um the chorus is um Give me faith like Daniel in the lion's den. Give me hope like Moses in the wilderness. Uh, Give me a heart like David. Lord, be my defense so that I can face my giants with confidence. And that should be um, kind of a prayer for all of us, but also knowing that if if you are a child of God, if you've been born again um, by grace through faith uh, in Christ, then um, through the power of God in us, us being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we can have uh, faith like Daniel and the hope that Moses had uh, wandering in the wilderness. We can have a heart um, after God's own heart. So uh, I'm going to try not to cry. (laughs) Okay, uh, we'll see how this goes.
you stand with us again um, for our last song this morning? Um, Who am I? That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. We have serve a God who loves beyond, beyond our understanding, wants to continue to just get to eat, get to know each one of us uh, even more, uh, even though he knows more about us than, than we do, but uh, to build that relationship uh, with God and with each other is the reason we are here this morning.
seated. I want you to think maybe to a time in your life when you encountered a pretty diverse group of people. For me, probably the most diverse group of people that I encountered was while I was attending a university. And this university, it was a Christian university, but there were people from all walks of life that attended there and, and many different faiths that, faiths that chose to attend that university. So it was a very diverse group of people. I learned from the very start that things would not be the way that they were in the town I grew up in. Uh, as I showed up in my room, I found out that one of my roommates who was just selected and happened to be in my room, one of them was a very shy guy, and he lived in a small coastal town near the Chesapeake Bay in Virginia. My other roommate was about six foot four, uh, probably about 230, and he was from a very, very rough part of Detroit, Michigan. Uh, his family had been involved in gangs, and he was trying to stay out of the drug dealing, and he was really trying to walk a clean path with the Lord. And so right away, I, I realized there, there are very many different types of people here. Over time, I met friends who were from different countries. I had a, a friend from Quebec, Canada, who was French-Canadian, one from Peru in South America, two friends from Bethlehem, Israel. One was a Muslim, and the other was a Jewish man. And so uh, we had some diversity that way as well. But some of my friends were Presbyterians and other ones were Pentecostals. We had Baptists and Grace Brethren and Methodists and Messianic Jewish congregations and people from Reformed churches and Catholic backgrounds. And we were all mixed into one university. But the neat thing was, even though there was so much difference between myself and many of the guys that were on my dorm floor and certainly among many of the people who attended the classes that I was in in the university, was that we were able to kind of get past our differences and focus on a common goal. And that was education for all of us and then spiritual growth for many of us as well. And so we united behind those common goals despite our differences. And really that's kind of our mission as a church as well, to create community out of people with a diversity of different backgrounds and opinions, but yet unite on those core things we can unify on, which we talked about last week. But again, how do we go about accepting one another? And that's what Paul deals with, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14. We'll get into that today. I want you to picture, guys, you invite uh, another guy that you know over to your house for a barbecue, okay? And, and he happens to be a builder by trade. And now there's some imperfections in your home or your apartment. And so as this guy walks in, he starts to take a look around. He says, can I give myself a little tour of your home? And so, so you say, yeah. And he looks around, he starts to kind of scrutinize your drywall. You patched that spot, didn't you? Didn't do a very good job. Kind of tell where the seam is. You know your countertop? It's got a, a burn mark in it. Looks like you had a small incident there. The carpet's kind of old. You know, I got a buddy who does some carpet, and I bet we could get some nice carpet in this place. You walk in your bathroom. Got some plumbing issues there, I see. You need a little bit of work. It's kind of a old shower. It's got some rust stains on the bottom. We need to help you out with that. And so he pulls out his phone and starts to call some subcontractors in the moment. and says, we'll have some people over tomorrow. Or ladies, you invite uh, some other women over to your home for a lunch. And one of those ladies happens to be an interior designer. She walks around your room and starts to check out your wall hangings. Those don't really fit the size of your room. Are you aware of that? Is that your family photo? Maybe you should have hired a professional photographer for that portrait. <laughs> Do you know this couch? It's actually a gray tone, but it should be more of a, a brown tone to fit this room. Some new couch pillows, they'd really make that sofa look nice. Do you know your bathroom towels don't match? And they start to walk through your home and pick out all the details, right? And then they pick out their phone, they start to make some phone calls. You know, we'll take care of that. Just give me your credit card number. I'll have somebody over tomorrow. And yet that is the tendency, even though we think that's absurd. Nobody would ever do that to us. We would never do that to anyone else. But when it comes to matters of faith, 
we tend to nitpick at each other in those ways, and it becomes a major hindrance to acceptance. And Paul is kind of entering into that climate religiously when he deals with this church in the city of Rome. And he starts this way in Romans 14.1. He says, receive, and the idea behind that word receive is keep taking people into your friend circles, right? Keep making friends of or fellowship with one who's weak in the faith. And so he's pointing out different categories here. Believers fall into various categories, and he says in the faith, various categories of maturity in the faith, various levels of faith. Some have maybe a stronger faith. Some have a newer faith. Some are more uncomfortable with certain things. But Paul says, keep receiving these types of people. Even though it's different from you, even though it's uncomfortable, friendships have to cross over these boundaries of differences in maturity within our Christian faith. So if all your friends are at your same level of, of maturity in the faith, something is not quite right. Uh, it's not as diverse as it should be. You're not welcoming people that you should be into your friend circles. So keep on receiving these people into your circles as friends. But then he cautions us, but not to disputes over doubtful things. When those two words were together in a lot of different Greek writers like Plato and some Greek historians, um, disputes over doubtful things, it literally means not for the purpose of passing judgment on opinions. And that's the idea behind this text, saying one's more correct than another. And this is a tendency that believers who are maybe a little bit more mature, who have a little bit more faith, believe they have a little bit more freedom in their faith, tend to want to do. They tend to want to correct believers who hesitate on certain issues, hesitate to exercise as much freedom in the faith. And it's the same thing as that contractor, that interior designer getting your business in your house. We want to point out all these things that are problems. We want to renovate each other, right? If you just had a little more maturity in the faith, you'd see things my way. And so we take our opinions and we talk to people and try to convince them, you know, into coming over to our side, even though maybe they are hesitant on certain things that we feel the complete freedom to do in our faith. We want to correct believers who are hesitant in different areas and say, just exercise your freedom in Christ. Jesus set you free. And we make them our project. But the problem is they're not our project. And these are not areas that are clearly prohibited in the Bible. These are matters of conscience or opinion. And they're not necessarily clearly permitted either, but we feel the freedom where they don't. Paul gives an example in verse 2. He says, for one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak in faith eats only vegetables. So you got somebody in your church, and they believe that consuming vegetables is what they ought to do in order to, to live out their faith, because maybe they have some concerns. Maybe they came from a Jewish background and in Judaism, there are a lot of dietary restrictions. I mean, they were eating kosher. And then they became a believer in Christ, and somebody more mature in the faith said, you know what, here's some pork. Why don't you dig into that pork? It's pretty tasty. Come on over to my house for a barbecue. And they're looking at them going, man, I don't know. We think about Daniel in the Old Testament who came into the Babylonian culture, and he had to ask the one who was over him as a servant of the king to allow him to just eat vegetables and not have to eat all the foods that the king put out at his table. And so maybe you have some Jews that are hesitant. Maybe you have some people from the Gentile world and they associate meats or, or things besides vegetables with idol worship. And they're not comfortable because that meat, it's been offered to a false god. And somebody who's more mature in the faith looks at that idol and says, it's a stone statue, man. What's the problem? It's not offering something to a real god or goddess. But yet somebody who has a past with idolatry says, I just can't go there. I don't, my conscience doesn't let me eat that food because it's been offered in worship to an idol. And so you have this difference, this weakness, not necessarily a bad weakness, but a hesitancy, a doubt over this matter of conscience in the faith. And there are a lot of things in this room that we may differ on in these areas of opinion. Here's a few. This is more like a grocery list. Maybe it's consuming alcohol. Some of you are completely fine with that as believers and feel the freedom to do so. Others of you, because of your culture or experience with alcoholism in your family, you would not touch alcohol with a 10-foot pole or even have it in your home. You don't feel that it's right. For others, maybe it's different levels of closeness when it comes to dating relationships or going to Vegas and uh, putting a few bucks in a slot machine, in a casino, playing a few hands of blackjack. Maybe it's the clothing that you wear. 
For some of you, uh, modesty maybe is, in some cultures, modesty is down to the ankles. When we spent time in Africa, if you weren't as a lady dressed in a skirt down to your ankles, people thought you might be a prostitute. And maybe in our culture, we have different standards of what modesty is or with swimwear, certain bathing suits, they're just a modest. And it's, again, it's our opinion. The Bible doesn't define clearly what modesty looks like, but we have our own definitions. Maybe it's the movies or the music or the shows that we watch. Maybe some of you were disappointed when all five songs this morning weren't hymns. <laughs> Maybe some of you were disappointed when one of them was. Maybe some of you feel the complete freedom to listen to many different genres of music, whether it's Christian-based or not, and, and that's fine for you. And others of you feel more restricted by your conscience. Or when you look at programs on TV or, or check out the rating of movies, there's a level that you'll not cross over. Maybe it's things like smoking cigarettes or uh, your beliefs about moms and whether or not moms should work outside of the home. Or maybe it's your political viewpoints. You believe that a certain political party is the right political party, and so you support it, but the person across the aisle from you feels very differently. Uh, since we're in the middle of COVID-19, probably each one of us could write down our personal opinions about wearing masks or social distancing, right? And we all have a different place. Well, maybe we'd settle on several different circles within this very room on things like that. And then there are things that pertain to worship, how formal or informal our worship services are, how we dress in church. The church that I grew up in, the specific church, I would probably not have been caught dead dressing this casually in that church. But for us here at Mountain View, this is, is normal, okay? Maybe it's about uh, when the rapture will happen, some of these theological ideas, or whether or not somebody should preach straight through books of the Bible, we have so many different opinions, and some of us, we feel strongly, our conscience even convicts us on this, those different areas. So we have differences in what our faith is comfortable with, how much faith we're comfortable in exercising in certain areas. And so Paul's going to give some very important words of caution next to people who are on both ends of that faith spectrum, who have stronger faith, more confidence that they can take more liberties, and people who have a more restricted faith. In verse 3, he says, Let not him who eats, so again, back to this example, the person who, who feels completely free to eat meat, let not him who eats despise, and that word means make utterly nothing of. So you're looking at somebody and going, if only you knew. You're so below me. You haven't arrived yet. Of him who does not eat. So this person who has a stronger conviction in this area feels less freedom in the area of eating vegetables versus meat. Don't despise that person and say, well, you're nothing. <laughs> you're so low in the faith because you haven't arrived at my level of freedom yet. And let him who does not eat, so this person who says, I, I can't in good conscience eat the meat. Don't let him judge him who eats. So don't look down on the person who's exercising more freedom and say, well, they are so ungodly. If they were really following the Lord, if they were really spiritual, they would know that it wasn't correct to eat this meat that's been offered to idols, false gods. They'd have the same conviction that I have. Don't do that. And so Paul is saying both condescension, where you look down on other people across the aisle from you, or condemnation, um, where you condemn somebody as doing something wrong over matters of conscience or matters of opinion, those are both inappropriate. So whether you have more faith and you're looking down on someone who has less, or whether you have less faith and you're condemning the person with more for being too free, both of those avenues are inappropriate for us. And it causes so many problems when we don't see things that way. He says, for God has received him. God's friends with him. And the picture there is this person that you are looking down on for their different viewpoint, their different level of faith. As you're looking down on them, Jesus is over there sitting across the table from him having a, a meal and talking like, like it's nothing, like there's nothing to even be concerned about. And you're just so irritated. You know, you feel such a need to, to defend your opinion. And Jesus, he just doesn't seem to have a problem with it. And it just teaches us that, you know, God's not concerned with these differences. It's not a big deal to God over these matters of opinion that aren't clearly defined in the Bible. Jesus is just having dinner like there's not a problem. And yet we make a problem out of things so easily. And there are certain responsibilities that fall to us. And there are certain responsibilities that fall to God, especially uh, in respect to different people's opinions and personal convictions. 
Up until this year, COVID-19 kind of changed this particular program that we were offering. But for the last two or three years, we had an after-school kids club program here on Wednesdays. And so from about 3.45 till about 5.15, we would walk over and take some students, about 20 to 30 students each week uh, from the elementary school over here and provide an after-school program for those, those kids. And everyone who volunteered, all of us, we had certain responsibilities toward those kids. We were bringing them over from the school, and so we were responsible for their safety as they walked along Highway 18. And so we had certain rules to try to encourage them to stay safe. You can't run. You can't walk out on the streets. You have to walk between the two, the two uh, volunteers who are in front and back. And so we did certain things to keep them safe. We wanted to provide a, a loving environment for them. And so we took time to, to engage with them personally, talk to them about their day, How's their life been? What's going on? Are there any problems or things that are heavy that are weighing on them? We gave them a healthy snack, some fun activities, uh, Bible teaching, uh, and also a craft or, or creative art project. And so we did certain things for them. Uh, we had some rules. You have to respect each other. You have to stay safe. You have to stop, look, and listen whenever we're talking uh, or when someone else is talking. And you have to raise your hand before you talk. Those were our responsibilities. But that's where our responsibility stopped. As soon as we would drop them off at their doorstep after the kids' club ended, or as soon as their parents would come through the door and sign them out, that's where our hands were off, right? At that point, it was the, their parents' responsibility because ultimately these were other people's kids, right? And so when it came to food and clothing and shelter, not our responsibility. When it came to discipline, not our responsibility. When it came to their home environment, not our responsibility. Homework, not our thing. The other six nights of the week besides Wednesday, that was on their parents, right? And as believers, we have certain responsibilities towards each other. And we talked about those mainly last week in those areas of unity. And we're going to talk about other things over the next few weeks, things like acceptance, these things that create more community. But there's a line where our responsibilities towards each other, they end. And after that point, the responsibility, it's not ours. It's their parent. And spiritually, we've been adopted into God's family. So there's a point at which it's God's responsibility in these matters of opinion and personal conviction. It's not ours. We're not trying to convince someone. You have to see things from my point of view because God's the one who's in charge of them. They're God's servant. And Paul says that in verse 4. Who are you to judge another servant, right? You guys, you're not my servant. I'm not your servant. We are the Lord's servants as we follow him. So we're not responsible for criticizing another person's servant. And that means each other because we all are God's servant. Just like you wouldn't criticize someone else's cook if you go over to their house and someone's cooking the food there, you're not going to criticize them. Someone else's cleaner, someone else's employee, right? That's their responsibility. We're not supposed to judge God's servants, and that's each other. Paul says, to his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God's able to make him stand. So we look at someone else and we think, well, their faith, you know, it's just, it's not restricted enough. Or their faith, it's not free enough. And Paul says, God's capable, all right? I know you think you have to do something. I know you think this person's not going to succeed in their faith without you, <laughs> but you're wrong. Because God is a lot more powerful than we are. And he's capable of establishing the faith of other believers, so we don't have to do that, especially in these matters of conscience or opinion. If God wants to change another believer's opinion, he's going to do it. He'll figure out a way, and it's going to be a lot more effective than if we try. In verse 5, it says, One person esteems one day above another, and other esteems, esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. So we're not responsible for criticizing another person's servant, Right? But we are responsible for being fully convinced of our own decisions. That is our responsibility. And so if we're going to celebrate holidays, say, well, one day is more significant than another. I think Sunday, Sunday is that day of rest, and you shouldn't touch that. You know, we're focused on church. When we go home, we're going to spend time together as family. We're going to focus on the Lord. That's great. And for another person who says, you know, Sunday, it's like the one day of the week that I don't have to work. And so in addition to doing those things, I'm going to go out and do some yard work and go, go out and try to have fun and, you know, uh, go camping or things like that. 
it's not necessarily wrong to have a different point of view. Someone says, well, you know, I don't celebrate Halloween or I don't celebrate Christmas because it's become too commercialized. Great. That's wonderful. But to look down on someone else who does, again, that's not appropriate. Um, because, again, one person has this idea, another person has something different. But Paul says the important thing is that, that we're fully convinced of our own decisions. He goes on, he says, he who observes the day observes it to the Lord. Hopefully, if a day feels more significant to us, um, we're making it that way because we feel like that's what's honoring to the Lord, right? Or to the Lord, he does not observe it. So for somebody who says, well, this day, it's the same as every other day, they're saying before the Lord, I feel that's the way things are. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat, to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks, so we're thankful whether we eat the vegetables or whether we eat the, the meat and everything else on the buffet. The important thing is that we're thankful to God and we're convinced in our own mind that we're doing what's right. For none of us, in verse 7, lives to himself and no one dies to himself. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or we die, we are the Lord's. It's this idea that we're accountable to God, ultimately. When your life is over... And God looks at the things that have happened. You're not going to answer to the person next to you or the person across the room from you, that other Christian who criticized you. You're going to answer to the Lord. And he's the one you're accountable to. And so when you're making these decisions about how you're going to live, you really need to do what's right between you and the Lord. And that's the decision that you need to make. It says, For this end, in verse 9, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Why do you show contempt for your brother? Why do you show disgust for your brother? Because Jesus, he died, he rose again, that he might be Lord of the dead and Lord of the living. And so Jesus, he's the one who's in charge. He's in charge of those who have died. He's in charge of us who are alive. And so he, again, is the, ones that, the one that we answer to. It continues on at the end of verse 10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. It's written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue confess to God. So then let each of us give, a, each of us shall give account of himself to God. And so it's this other responsibility, right? We're responsible for confessing our own actions at this point in time called the judgment seat of Christ. What's a judgment seat? Uh, we might think of it as uh, before the judge at the court, because in Bible times, oftentimes the, the Roman tribunals, people like Pontius Pilate, there would be a series of steps, and then that person making those, those legal decisions would sit in a chair on top. And that's what a judgment seat is. That's what the bima, which is the Greek word here, for judgment seat is referring to. And it's, so it, it fast forwards to a day when each of us, we have an appointment, and we walk up those steps, and we stand before Christ, and we are confessing our actions. Lord, this is, this is what I did in life. This is why. And God is revealing those things to us. And now that may be a point of concern. We think, well, how's the Lord going to judge me? What's going to happen? Is my eternity at stake at this judgment? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, they clarify what happens at this judgment. This judgment seat of Christ is a judgment for believers. And so heaven or hell is not at stake. Our faith in Christ has brought us into God's family, has given us the righteousness we, we need so that we are not in danger of eternal judgment, eternal separation from God or consequences. Instead, this judgment seat of Christ, it's a judgment of rewards. It's a judgment of rewards. 1 Corinthians 3 describes what happens. It says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul says, as a wise builder, I laid the foundation." No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is Jesus Christ. And so the basics, the core that we kind of share, it's all founded on Jesus, right? And then Paul says in verse 12, If anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, whatever material, each one's work will become clear. For the day, the day of judgment, will declare it. It'll be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each person's work of what sort it is. And so the things that we've done and our motives behind that, it's like Jesus' judgment is a fire. It says, if anyone's work which he has built endures, he'll be rewarded. If anyone's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. Yet so is through fire. So it's this idea with, with our actions, we stand before the Lord. 
and he tests our motives. And if we're doing things throughout life to honor him, he's going to reward us for that. And we don't know exactly what those rewards look like in eternity, but he has rewards in store. And if our motive was just selfishness the entire time and we did things to please ourselves and do what we thought was best in our own eyes, a lot of those works are going to poof, just burn up and we won't be left with any reward. We'll still have eternity, but we'll be kind of lacking in the rewards department. Okay, and so that's that judgment seat of Christ. But we're responsible for what we do. That's our responsibility. But our responsibility, again, isn't to renovate everyone around us and turn them into what we think Christ wants them to be. That's his job. That's his responsibility. And so I want to stop this morning and kind of conclude with some different resolutions. What do we want to do? What should our goals be throughout that? There was a study that was published in the Clinical Journal of Psychology, and it talked about the 10 most common New Year's resolutions. I don't know if any, are any of you New Year's resolution people? Okay, not really. <laughs> this is interesting. Here are some of the more common ones, the 10 most common. Exercising more, losing weight, getting organized, learning a new hobby or skill, living life to the fullest, that's five, saving more and spending less money, quitting smoking, spending more time with family and friends, traveling more and reading more. Those were the top 10 New Year's resolutions. What was interesting was that only 46% of people who made those resolutions kept any of them, okay? But only 4% of people who said, I'm not making a New Year's resolution, I'm not going to keep them anyway, I'll just have a couple of goals for the year. Only 4% of those people actually made their goals. And so it's actually... Percentage-wise, it's more effective to make a resolution than it is to just say, oh, I'm not going to do a resolution. I'm just going to make a goal because you really probably won't achieve those. People who set goals instead of resolutions don't tend to be successful. And Paul's telling us here in, at the end of chapter 14 that we really need to make a couple of resolutions. We need to resolve to do things. In fact, he, he uses that exact word with respect to accepting one another. We need a couple resolutions. Even if you fail, even if you're that, that 54% who's not quite going to achieve this, these are two resolutions that you need to make. He says in verse 13, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve, okay, there's that resolution, this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. That's the first resolution, okay? And Stumbling block, that's kind of a, it's like a tripping hazard in today's lingo. But there's another place in 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter talks about stumbling block, and he, he renames it, he has another name for stumbling block, and it's a rock of offense. So when the Bible talks about stumbling blocks, it's talking about things that offend people, okay? So don't, again, knowingly cause a brother or sister in the Lord to be offended, don't throw something in their way by what you do that's, that's knowingly going to offend them. That's resolution number one. Don't intentionally offend somebody else in the family of faith. Okay. He expounds on that a little bit in verses 14 and following. Paul says, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. And so, again, on this idea of things that offend other people, it's okay to be confident in your faith. You say, you know, I know I have the freedom to do this. That's okay. But it's also okay to say, I feel like that's unclean. My conscience, it doesn't allow me to go there. I can't watch that movie. I can't consume that beverage. I can't do it. Both of those things are absolutely okay. Okay, keep that in mind. Verse 15, yet if your brother is grieved, and that word is literally distressed because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. So another thing that has to do with offending people or preventing offense, we should curb our freedoms when we know there'll be a cause for distress. So if you have a friend who's really struggled with alcoholism and you know that that's a battle, the worst thing that you could do as a friend to love them is to offer them a glass of wine at a meal at your home because you know that's a possible tripping hazard. You, you could trip them up. Now, maybe you don't know about someone's life and you do something unknowingly. That's not what we're talking about here. This is uh, as we get to know each other, and hopefully that happens more and more as we spend time around each other, we, we become closer and closer friends and more vulnerable, and we realize, you know, this person, they don't cross that line. It's not a biblical command, 
but that's where they feel like they have to draw the line for whatever reason. And so when we're around them, we don't bring them anywhere close to that line, all right? We help them avoid that line. When we're with someone else who maybe has the same freedom that we have in a certain area, we're okay with it. We exercise our freedom. But when that person is near us, we walk in love and we curb our freedom. We check it. We hold it back in order to look out for that other person's need. It continues, don't destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Because if you don't check your freedom, another believer's faith could collapse. You could be that thing that destroys their faith just because you wanted them to experience a little bit more freedom. But it could crush their faith. Verse 16 also says, don't let your good be spoken of as evil. What you're doing, your freedom, it could also be criticized as evil, even though the Bible doesn't spell it out and say, well, that's evil. Someone else will talk about it as if it is. So we have to be careful to check ourselves, especially around people who we know don't uh, possess or feel like they can possess the same amount of freedom to make a certain choice. For the kingdom of God, it's not eating and drinking. So all these issues, all these different differences of opinions, that's not God's kingdom. That's not eternally important. What is important is righteousness, right living before God, taking what we do know for sure and incorporating it into our lives. That's important. Peace, experiencing a a peaceful relationship with other believers in Christ, that's important. And having joy, whether it's through freedom or through personal restriction, if it brings you joy as a believer, that's an important thing. And so those are important, not specifically, you know, again, exercising or restricting specific rights. These are the important things. The core of God's kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy as the Holy Spirit controls our lives, and we make the decisions that he wants us to make. That's what makes us acceptable before God. It's not maybe uh, how much freedom we exercise or how little freedom we exercise. God's sitting across from the table with us regardless of how we feel about these other issues. Therefore, and this is the second one, second resolution, okay? First is don't put a stumbling block, a cause for offense before a brother or sister in Christ knowingly. The last one is, Therefore, let us pursue, Paul says, the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify or build up another person. So resolution two is concentrate on pursuing peace and spiritual growth, which is kind of refreshing. You know, it's not about our personal opinions in so many areas. When we get together with each other, whether it's in a home fellowship or whether it's across the table in a Bible study or at a men's discipleship group, or at at our house over dinner, or at a church picnic like we experienced last week, we really need to focus our intentions and our efforts on pursuing peace. I had to do that a lot at my university. There were some people that really liked to get into arguments and debates, but those things weren't necessarily worth debating. Those differences weren't. It was the things that connected us that we needed to focus on. And so, so even though we have different opinions about certain issues, how can we focus on having a peaceful relationship or maybe agreeing to disagree and moving on from that point. We know their differences. We know our differences. We love each other anyway, and we move on. We want peace and spiritual growth because, again, there's so much that we can agree on, what God's Word is clear on that will actually help us grow, and those are not necessarily the matters of our own opinions. So how do we take this and build it into our community, because community is acceptance. I feel like there is so much of church history over the past couple of thousand years that probably would have taken a different turn had we actually internalized what we're, what we're reading in this passage, because I feel like over, over centuries, Christian churches have become really great at disagreeing with one another and, and separating and avoiding one another, but if we would just take to heart what's here we would not only uh, notice the differences, but we would allow some of these differences and even appreciate people for it. We can learn a great deal from people who disagree with us, right? They expand uh, our perspective sometimes, and, and they help to balance out God's church because we're not always, our opinion is not the, the right opinion in all circumstances. And so it's important to understand that God balances out his body through this type of diversity, So here's a few things that we can do to, again, take action on these things today. And as we start these home fellowship groups, hopefully build it into that as well. As we get to know one another better on Sundays or other experiences as a church. First of all, form friendships with believers who are different from you, who don't necessarily agree with you in every way. 
and learn to appreciate the differences. Don't think, well, I'm going to renovate them. One of these days, if they just become my friend and we're around each other long enough, they're going to become just like me. They'll see it my way. Don't go there. Appreciate the differences and learn to have great dialogues and conversations. Build acceptance in, but pursue those friendships. Secondly, be fully convinced of your own personal decisions. I am not in any way telling you to violate your personal convictions. If you can't feel convicted about setting a line a certain place, set it. If that's before the Lord, what he wants you to do. And know that that's completely okay, as long as it's not clearly defined in Scripture. Be convinced. Make your decision before the Lord. Thirdly, let God be in charge of convicting other believers on matters of conscience and opinion. Maybe you really strongly feel that a certain viewpoint would be so much better for your good friend. Realize that that good friend, he is not your kid. He is the Lord's. And God is more than capable of changing that person's opinion or their conscience, if it needs to be changed. Or he's capable of changing your point of view. And then fourthly, don't knowingly cause offense, but rather pursue the things of peace and building each other up. Those are the two resolutions, right? Don't throw out the stumbling blocks when you know it's coming. Um, and focus on peace and spiritual growth in the areas that you do know clearly from the Bible. And if we do that, we'll get along great. And we'll have a pretty eclectic, diverse group of people here at Mountain View as well. Let's go ahead and pray together this morning.